Before I ask the first speaker to come up, though, I'd like to give you just a brief introduction to orthopedic services at Memorial. Now, last year we did over uh, or nearly 4,900 surgical procedures in orthopedic services, over 1,000 of those specifically for hip and knee replacement. And that's an important number, not just because it's a really high number, but because studies show time and time again, especially with certain types of surgeries like hip and knee replacement, that organizations and physicians who do higher numbers have better results with their patients. So that is definitely something to keep in mind. You want to make sure when you're considering a total joint replacement, you want to look at the volume, not only from the organization, but also the surgeon as well. One of our more established programs within orthopedic services is Joint Works, and that is our program for hip and knee replacement surgery. And again, we do a high volume, and our success is due in part for several reasons. One, we really focus ahead of time on preoperative education. We give our patients a lot of information, some say a little too much, but we figure uh, too much is better than not enough. We encourage education classes. We have a lot of reading material. We have a first steps program, which that's something that Dr. Adair may address a little bit later, but that is a that's a class designed for patients who are even just thinking about having surgery or you know, have at least about six weeks until their surgery date because there are things that you can do in that six week time period that will really set you up to have a better outcome after the procedure. So we go over all of that with you. We have standardized anesthesia, anesthesia protocols. That's very key. We have pain management protocols. We have same-day therapy. So we're a little aggressive in our approach to therapy, but that's in your best interest. After a total joint replacement surgery, you've got to get up and get moving right away. You stay in bed, kind of take it easy, you're not going to get the outcomes that you want. And then we have a low length of stay. On average, our hip and knee replacement patients stay about two days in the hospital. Sometimes people think, well, I'd like to stay a little bit longer, but with total joint, Quick in and out is the way to go. That is going to give you your best results. Now we also uh, really monitor our patient satisfaction. One way we do that is through uh, discharge phone calls. We call our patients after they leave the hospital to make sure that they've had a smooth transition back home, understand all of their instructions they were given in the hospital, um, are taking their pain medication appropriately, blood thinner questions, we'll answer those. But then we ask two questions. One is, did we meet your service expectations while you were in the hospital? So how was your experience? Um, and as you can see, consistently, this is over that uh, last fiscal year, we do very well. Okay? We work very hard at meeting the needs, uh, the service expectations of our patients. And on average, we meet that 99% of the time. We also ask if we met your pain management expectations. That's probably one of the biggest fears when a patient comes to us for a hip or knee replacement surgery. They want to know if it's going to hurt and how much. So, uh, you know, we do a lot of our education related to pain management up front, and then we monitor it on the back side. How do we do? Did we, did we meet your expectations? You know, we're not going to tell you that it's not going to hurt. That wouldn't be fair to you because it does, it is a little bit uncomfortable, but the pain has to be manageable so that you can get up and get going. And most of the time, people who come to us with hip or knee replacement surgery, they're not strangers to pain. Okay? They, they're in pain right now. So it's not different, but the nice thing is that the, the surgical pain goes away over time. So uh, we do monitor pain management very closely. Another thing that we like to do is every once in a while we like to ask an outside source to come take a look at our program to make sure that we are doing the right things for our patients. And we did ask the Joint Commission, uh, who, who does the, the accreditations for the hospitals, to come in. They had an expert from that organization come to our hospital and really look at our program with a fine tooth comb to make sure that we were adhering to all of the highest standards of care. And we were, so they were, they were impressed with our program. They gave us a certification in, in hip and knee replacement surgery that we're very proud of, not because it's an award, but because it means that we're doing the right thing for our patients. And we're one of um, only 10 Illinois hospitals that have achieved this for our hip and knee replacement patients. Most of the other ones are in the Chicago area. 
We've also achieved the uh, Blue Description Center for Hip and Knee Replacement as well as Spine Surgery from Blue Cross Blue Shield. Again, just further testament to our commitment to high quality of care for our patients. Something that's fairly new uh, but very exciting is that we've chosen to participate in the American Joint Replacement Registry. Now this is a database of, of information related to joint replacement from patients all across the country. Other countries have been using joint replacement registries for many years and have had wonderful results in improving the patient care. The United States is getting on board with this now. So we were one of the first 32 hospitals to participate in the level one data. We were recently selected as one of 15 hospitals to uh, be a pilot for increasing that data to level two. So we're pretty proud to participate in this because ultimately we know that it's going to lead to better care for our patients. We also participate in a registry, a national registry, um, sponsored by the American Orthopedic Association called Over the Bone. And this is designed for patients with osteoporosis and fragility fractures. Osteoporosis is a, um, oh, it's a, it's, a, it's a horrible disease because a lot of people don't know they have it until after they break a bone. So uh, once you break a bone, you have osteoporosis, you're more likely to fall or break another bone. So we really have to try to, to, to hit that hard to prevent future fractures from occurring. And as you can see, the US uh, News World Report, we're among a handful of patients who voluntarily participate in this registry as well. So that's, a, that's a, something that is very nice for our community. Big handful of those patients that fracture something related to osteoporosis are hip fracture patients. Uh, we have a, unfortunately, a lot of people fracture their hip every year. And studies, I'm we're constantly reading the literature, and time and time again, says that you know if you want to have the best outcome, you need to get your patients to surgery in a timely manner. Okay, so uh, we were doing pretty good. We had a little room for improvement, but we. <coughs> That 48 hour window is pretty key. So we really focus on making sure that our patients, now it's not always possible, it depends on if you know, the, the person's medically stable, but we really try very hard to get our patients to surgery within that 48 hour time period because that's going to set you up for the best possible outcomes. Probably the one thing that I'm most excited about that's uh, fairly new is our patient and family advisory panel that we have in orthopedic services. This is our opportunity to hear from people who've actually gone through the procedure. We ask them, you know, what worked for you? What could we do better? This is the best way that we can improve our programs. So we have uh, patients and family come in periodically. We meet um, every other month and uh, give us their advice, and we take it. We've made a lot of nice changes um, over the past uh, year, year and a half or so, based on uh, these recommendations. So, I will be around throughout the entire presentation, and at the end, if you have additional questions for me, I would love to have them, and be happy to answer them for you. But I would like to introduce Dr. Sala. Um, he is talking in the back, and he's got to talk up here now. So um, he's going to come talk to you about uh, joint replacement, and you're going to be in for a treat with uh, these speakers tonight. Good afternoon, everybody. I don't know if you can hear me. He's trying to get the, uh, uh, the uh, microphone and the system going. Thanks for being here. I know it's kind of cold outside. And I'm just going to ask if it's okay with everybody ask Michael to turn down the condition, air conditioner here, if that's all right. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's cold out there, and I really appreciate you being here with us tonight. We've got a, a couple of uh, speakers and colleagues that I respect immensely to be here with us. Uh, can you hear me okay? Can I? Oh, really? 
I, oh, I just want to let you know is that you all signed over your mortgage. So <laughs> let me just go. Lawyer's got it. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll just turn over. How about I use the other one, Michael? Just the regular microphone. Mike, you can start turning down the air conditioner now. I'll use the regular microphone if you want. Check, check, check. All right. All right. Can everybody hear me okay now? Yeah. All right. Just make sure you give me those uh, mortgage serial numbers, please. We'll take care of you very well here. All right. I'm, uh, I've been asked to, uh, to give the talk here about what's recent in joint replacement. Uh, obviously, joint replacement is one of the most successful procedures we have in orthopedic surgery. Quite frankly, in all of medicine, if you ask patients, uh, if I talk too fast, it's okay. My wife gives up on me, so just describe, just, just, just don't worry about it, just have a nice sleep. Um, joint replacement really makes a huge difference in people's lives. If you compare it to any procedure we do in medicine, it is the one that provides patients with the most dignity, activity, and function. That's why you see these massive numbers going through the roof, plus we're rocking it as baby boomers. We are the most prevalent, and we're taking over this country. I hope you don't mind, so I'm very proud of that. I hail from SIU. I'm the chair of orthopedics there. We have a great bunch of guys that are just uh, can't do what I do without their help. But the most important thing that we do in terms of surgery is we have a great collaboration with Memorial. They have a wonderful joint uh, works program that works amazingly well. They have about 70 people if you look at the entire program that provide the really top-notch, cutting-edge care. And that collaboration is key, as you heard from Jennifer. By the way, did she do a great job? Yes, <laughs> Jennifer does a great job the same way every day in our clinics and our hospitals. She keeps us going. So that, uh, that camaraderie, that collegiality is critical. That partnership is key. We take care of the patients, not just from the time they decide to have an operation, but she takes care of them all the way until they go home. So when she asked me to talk, one of the things she asked me to say, you know, uh, that's all. What can we do to really, you know, educate our, you know, patients uh, in terms of not joint replacement? And I'm sharing with you sort of the most recent advances that's occurred in joint replacement. And in perspective, having been doing this for over 20 years now, I'd like to share with you the most common questions. Is that okay? All right. So. Here's, uh, if it's not, it's too late, I already did the PowerPoint, so I'm sorry about that. <laughs> so what patients ask about, these are the things they expect, okay? They want the restoration of their function, they want to do what they want to do. And you have to understand, our generation is baby boomers and have higher expectations. We're not going to be sitting around doing nothing watching TV. Uh, we are going to be active, we are demanding to be uh, less painful, we want to be able to do the things we want to do, we want to have less stiffness. But at the end of the day, we want to have a procedure that will get us going back to where we were in and out with the least amount of complications. And the advances in joint replacement have been impressive over the last 30 years. So I'm sorry for the busy slide, so I'll summarize. This slide actually is a survey that's occurred all over the world and was published about a year and a half ago asking patients about joint re replacement. This is specifically knees, but there's a, even a better one in, um, in hips. The bottom line is, is that joint replacement really meets patients' expectations. It allows them to do everything from going back to work, all the way to improve sexual activity, to improve the ability to walk. So it's really uh, impressive. That's why I started my talk by saying joint replacement is the most effective procedure in all of medicine. Now the question that I get, should we delay the surgery? So with that in mind, I'm going to go to the, to the, to the way I answer is following. Arthritis is degenerative. Basically, it's a progressive disease. It is a reflection of our aging. And somebody described arthritis, one of my mentors when I was in medical school, as the disease that starts the day we're born. And it's just an accumulation of that trauma, degenerative disease that accumulates eventually to the point that you can't function. Early diagnosis definitely has a huge impact in terms of your outcomes. We know that patients that get surgery sooner or later have better outcomes. So Dr. Leo Ludwig is going to be talking to you about the treatment of arthritis and then its implications, but at the end of the day, it's critical to stop and say, all right, I'm losing sleep, I can't function, I'm, doing, I'm not doing the things I enjoy the most. Those are three critical factors that says, all right, we need to move forward with the joint replacement. 
Delaying the surgery actually has been shown to him impact your outcomes for over two years after the operation. So you want to make sure that you don't lose muscles, bone strength, tendon, stability. All these things can progress and get worse if you wait too long. And finally, and this is Dr. Uh, Dr. Adair's uh, talk, but I, I want to just point out a couple of things. And I'm sorry you can't see all the way down there. But basically it says pre-existing medical conditions may become more serious by delaying the elective procedure. So you want to get basically the best time you can do the surgery when you're healthy, you're active, when you are, uh, uh, have all your medical, chronic diseases all under control. So the next question is, how is it done? So I'm going to show you a couple of schematics. Now I'm going to start with HIP. And I'm just going to click on that to make sure the video is going to play. So this is a hip with that. So you can see the hip is covered by muscles everywhere. You can't get to the hip without splitting muscles. So I, I please stay away from looking at the internet. But this is how it's done. You basically, we dislocate the ball out of the socket. We replace the socket where the arthritis is with a metal cup with a plastic inside. And then we put a femoral component inside the bone, which is hollow, and allows it to articulate. So this is how it works. So you can see that pretty well. That takes away the pain by removing that articulate or the painful part inside the joint, which is the cartilage. Knees, very similar. We go ahead and split the muscles again, and we remove in here the muscles, and the knee obviously straightens up and bends. We create these cuts surgically using cutting edge technology, put the implants in place. Again, plastic between those two metals. Plastic attached to the cartilage. And that's the motion that comes basically after restoration of that anatomical line. So what's new in the design of implants? Well, bottom line is we now understand the knee kinematics, the way it moves, how the two bones work together, how the ligaments work together, the muscles a lot better than we did 30 years ago. But even then, we had good results. Now we have superior results as a result of that. Understanding the kinematics of a normal knee and then reproducing that at an aging age when the knee has been degenerative is actually the greatest strength, I think, that we have gained over the last 30 years. We're a little more soft tissue friendly. We're using smaller implants to mimic or reproduce the anatomy. I think you've heard about the, in the past some of an advertisement about there's a woman knee versus a man knee. Well, I think it's the bottom line is we're producing the anatomy of the patient. We have more sizes. We are able to do that and be a little more soft tissue friendly. Instrumentation has also advanced significantly. And as a result of that, we're able to create those cuts and restore those deformities so that the extremity is aligned and able to perform at a higher and better function with less pain. So let me take you for an example. Uh, we'll say this is Mrs. Ray's. She actually came in in a wheelchair. And what do you see on the x-rays? Anybody point out? Yes, it's the arthritis. I agree. What else? Yeah, one is, one is, one is point out. This one is not me, right? And there's a bit of a giant way going on, okay? So this is called a windswept deformity. She hasn't walked for four years before she came. There's another thing that you can point out. If you look at the bone here, what do you think about the bone strength up here versus down here? It's a lot less bone, isn't there? So this poor lady, because she's been in a wheelchair for four years, she hasn't been walking. So she lost a lot of strength in the bone, and as a result of that, this actually lost significant and important structural uh, component that you can't just build up overnight. So this deformity, and you can see here, we literally have to prop her and you don't see his, all her arms, but both her sons had to hold her up in order to get this exit with her standing up. And you can see the deformity that she has. We draw a line from the hip to the ankle because in a normal person, that line should go right in the middle of the knee. But you can see here, it's so outside of the knee, it's unbelievable. And maybe less so on the left side. But at the end of the day, we went ahead and made the decision to move forward with the knee replacement. We did the left one first and then the more complicated one, and here's what the left one looks like. And we're able to see how that line comes right back in the middle of the joint. So she, this became her quickly her left knee, but she still was using the wheelchair, but now she was able to get out of the wheelchair and help her husband get to the, uh, to help around the house and use a walker. Then we went ahead and did her right knee, and this is what she looked like. Here's her first operation. So here's before, 
Here's the first operation, and here's her second operation. And she was able to get up and walk after the second operation immediately afterwards. So, but one of the questions I had out there is the ability to go back to work. Can you go back to work after a knee replacement? And the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, this is Mr. McLeod. He's actually a mailman and had been on disability because of his knee. If you look at the right one, it looks kind of weird, right? There's nothing between the joint and it's quite arthritic. And if you take a look at the side, and I hate to point, get medical on me, but he's got these bone spurs up here. He's got a pediatric condition called hypoplastic proximal tibia. Um, and this has been quite dramatic for him. So as a result of that, here's what his knee looks like in surgery, before the surgery. <coughs> it's just absolutely locked there. It will not bend past that. It's an end point, it's pretty hard. Again, you're gonna see one more motion. It's also quite bow-legged. And he can't straighten up all the way, as you can tell here. And it's really, really, really hard to bend that knee. And he's been living with this for some time. So here's after the surgery. This is what it looks like. And here's the actual operation two hours later. Sorry for the dressings that's afterwards do that. And this is immediately after. And he was able to go back to work two months later. So, so the instrumentation, the surgery, all that combined together with the rehabilitation really can have a significant outcome. The other things that we have obviously is developing new biomaterials. These materials are uh, definitely are little more or less potential for them to create debris and wearing out, so they last even longer. And as, as a result, you have these uh, potential for these implants really to last for multiple decades. How about minimally invasive surgery? I get about that. We do minimally invasive surgery. But you have to understand, it depends on the patient, right? So if you have patients such as overweight people, people that have muscular or a lot of muscles around their knee, and or they have other procedures that it means scarring tissue, it's going to be tough to get around the knee. So you need to see what you need to take care of, and as such, the incision is based on that. So don't get hung up on that. I, I get that quite often about, well, I heard about this and I went on the internet. I tell you that the most important thing is for the surgeon to do what they do well in a high volume. That's critical to optimize the outcome. So the incision really is not a true reflection. In fact, if you compare patients with minimally invasive versus uh, standard incision, the outcome is the same. In fact, some would even say there's increased complications because you cannot see as well. Computer-assisted surgery, absolutely helpful. Uh, again, it reproduces that component position that we talked about, so critical to get that beautiful alignment. We use it as we need it, but definitely in those extreme cases, we're worried about deformity. Robotics, again, the same thing. It can add a significant amount of time to the procedure, but it has been shown to have some improvement in component position, so. Uh, but obviously, there's issues still being worked out, but there's a big, uh, uh, again, there's a lot of marketing based on these uh, uh, instrumentation, so you've got to keep that in perspective, and the science really truly doesn't completely blur it out as being the go-to instrument. How about mental allergies? I hear about that quite often. Yes, there's increased mental allergies in some women because of jewelry and so on, but quite frankly, there's a lot of ways to test for that before the surgery, so I recommend for patients that have nickel allergies specifically to go see an allergist to confirm that is definitely the case. So that's important, and there's implants that work around that so that these allergies don't bother you. But everybody reacts to, bi uh, to biomaterials, so it's important to get an understanding of that, and your allergist can help you there. <coughs> so that's all I have to talk about. Uh, I'd like to re uh, reflect what Dr. Solid said, and just thank you for coming out on a cold evening. I'm going to talk about the conservative treatment for hip and knee arthritis, and if we have a little time, I want to talk a little bit about uh, informed consent. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the 800-pound gorilla uh, that's walking around the hospitals and every doctor's office in the entire country, okay? So I'm going to get at this kind of through the back door. This is the most common question I was asked in the last three months of 2013. Well, I'd be able to get my joint replacement done under Obamacare. 
Okay? So the answer to that is yes, but. Okay, you may have to endure more conservative treatment, or you may have to explain to the doctor why you're not a candidate or don't want to do that conservative treatment. You may have to go through an optimization program, and Dr. Adair is going to talk about that a little bit, to lose weight, get your diabetes under control, stop smoking, improve your overall conditioning and health. So that's what you're going to have to do. What am I going to have to do? I'm going to have to document more in an electronic medical record, so you're probably seeing more doctors interacting with computers than they are with you in the office, which is sad. I'm going to have to document more detailed information about the conservative treatment you had, you failed it, or why you don't want to have it done, or why you can't have it done. Maybe you got stomach ulcers, so you can't take arthritis pills. I'm going to also have to document what your x-rays look like, and what your functional limitations are. Many of you may be scheduled for total joint replacements already, and you've been given surveys in, in one of our offices that says, you've got to fill this out before you get your surgery done, because we're keeping track of your outcomes. So all this stuff is being sort of forced on us to a certain extent. Why is that? Okay, the first thing is a thing called a RAC. A recovery audit contractor, they're hired by Medicare, they come into the hospital, they look at the record, and they see if there's proper documentation. And if there's not proper documentation, they can tell the hospital, I want that money back that we gave you. Doctors are going to soon be reviewed as well. So the doctors are going to be under the same <coughs> analysis. And really, they're trying to guarantee that the surgery is necessary, and we understand that. But, you know, they're incentivizing these people. So the more reviews they do, the more they say don't meet criteria, the more money they get paid. So they're going to be incentivized to say that these things don't meet criteria. And you can uh, appeal them. But the appeal process is difficult, it takes time. So, for example, one of you could be having your total joint done. Six months later, the rack comes in and says, you know what, that didn't meet criteria. We're taking the money back from the hospital and the doctor, and you might be home doing great. So because of this, everybody's going to be more concerned about proper documentation. You might be asked to do more conservative treatment before you're offered a total joint replacement. What's the other reason? The other reason is this 30-day readmissions. The hospitals are soon going to be uh, responsible for all 30-day readmissions, all causes, financially responsible. So if you come back in within 30 days, that care has to be provided for free. Doctors are already at a 50% cut for taking care of any complications after total joint replacement. And studies have shown that people with BMIs that are heavier, with over 35, smokers, diabetics, sicker patients, have a higher complication rate and a higher risk of 30-day readmissions. The cost of an infected total joint replacement could range anywhere from eighty dollars to $150,000, and the hospital is taking on a financial risk on that. So you can imagine that is concerning to hospital administrators. They want to reduce the risk on the front end. So that's why a lot of these programs are being started. You need to get healthier, you need to get your diseases under control, you need to get your weight under control, you need to stop smoking. So let's go on and talk a little bit about what I'm supposed to talk about. Uh, these are basically the conservative treatments for hip and knee. Uh, you can take anti-inflammatory medications over the counter or things that the doctor prescribes for you. Low impact exercise is designed to help you strengthening your balance, your range of motion. You can use walking aids like a cane or a walker. Certain pain medicines are probably okay to use, and we'll go into that in a little more detail. Cortisone shots uh, can be utilized occasionally. In the hip, they should be done either under ultrasound or x-ray guidance so that they're put in the proper location. And as far as knees are concerned, uh, knee braces can be utilized. And in the knee, there's a little bit different as far as injections. There's these visco supplementation shots. You maybe know them as chicken shots or rooster comb shots. 
And we'll talk a little bit about some newer injections called growth factors or PRP. So non -steroidals. we're all <coughs> familiar with these. Aleve, ibuprofen, you can get them over the counter. There's lots of prescription ones. If you look at drugs like maybe Celebrex or Mobic, they may be a little safer to use with people who have stomach issues. People who can't take them are people who have kidney disease, history of GI bleeding and <coughs> ulcers, and maybe people who are on blood thinners for their heart or other conditions like Coumadin or Plavix. If you're going to take them long term, usually your primary care physician should be monitoring your kidney function to make sure those drugs are not damaging your kidneys. And um, one thing I forgot to mention in the previous slide is when we're talking about the knee, there is what's called a clinical practice guideline that our academies come out with that gives us recommendations on how to treat knee arthritis conservatively. So some of this information comes from that guideline. And if you look at those guidelines, they say that there's a strong recommendation for the use of these drugs in arthritic knee uh, patients. How about exercise? Everybody asks me, is it okay to exercise with an arthritic joint? And I think the answer is yes, as long as it's low impact, like bicycling, walking, elliptical machines, using strengthening with light weights. I think balance is really important in the older age group. And so that comes with core strengthening and some balance exercises. And especially for total knee for patients, the best predictor of your post-operative range of motion is what your pre-operative range of motion is. So if you can maintain good motion <coughs> pre-operatively, then your chances of getting a good result after surgery is better. And again, if we look at that clinical practice guideline that our academy has come out with, it's a strong recommendation for this. Knee braces, sometimes these knee sleeves can give you a little support or keep the a knee warm or insulate the knee. There's some braces called unloader braces, which this is an example of, that may help correct some ambulatory deformity, may unload that arthritic compartment. Most of the time they're used to, uh, for more vigorous activities such as your exercises or walking. And if you look at those clinical practice guidelines, it's inconclusive. So there's no studies that say it's definitely good or definitely bad. So they can't come up with a conclusion on that one. How about walking aids? The reason these help you is a cane can take about 30% of the weight off of your arthritic uh, joint if you use the cane in the opposite hand. And a walker obviously will take even more weight off. And a lot of these are used for balance purposes too. So they can prevent falls or have some safety factor involved with them. How about pain medicine? If you look at these clinical practice guidelines, uh, a drug called Tramadol or Ultram as a strong recommendation. But when you get to stronger narcotics, and I recommend patients try to stay away from these, things like Norco, Vicodin, which is hydrocodone, Tylenol number three with codeine, Oxycontin, or the pain patches. If you can, it's best to stay away from them. And the reason is, it's because these drugs can be addictive. They make your doctor's job after your surgery harder because it's harder to control your pain after surgery. There's also many studies in total knee patients that show if you're on these narcotics before surgery, your chances of having an excellent result are poor. You're less likely to have a good result if you're on a lot of pain medicine before the surgery because it's more difficult to get through the rehabilitation. If you look at the clinical practice guidelines, it's inconclusive for those drugs as well as Tylenol. So there's no studies that say that really it works well or it doesn't work well. So it boils down to a discussion between you and your doctor, but my recommendation to most people is stay off of them. How about injections? Cortisone is a very powerful anti-inflammatory. That's how it gets its effect. In my own practice, I like to limit the number of shots. I don't like to give any more than three in a particular joint. I won't give them any more frequently than about three months apart. And one thing I do recommend to patients, if you're going to have a total joint replacement after a cortisone shot, I tell them to wait about 8 to 12 weeks because that cortisone may increase your risk of infection if you do it too soon. <coughs> There's really no way to predict who's going to respond or how long it lasts. The doctor is really just giving you the shot and you see what happens. There's very rare adverse reactions. You can see them. Infection, this chondrolysis means that some of the times that uh, cortisone can destroy uh, some of the good cartilage in your knee, so you want to be careful 
in that situation. Some people can be allergic to it. And I give people who are diabetics a warning that their blood sugars are probably going to go up for a few days after a cortisone shot. So they need to be aware of that and look out for it. As we told uh, you before, the hip injections probably should be done under ultrasound or x-ray guidance so that they're put in the proper location. And if you look at our clinical practice guidelines, this is an uh, inconclusive recommendation. So they don't have studies that say one way or another. This is the rooster comb or chicken cartilage, what we call visco supplementation. It's only approved for knees by the FDA. There's about three or four products that are available on the market. You can either get single or multiple shot regimens. They work about the same. You can repeat them about every six months according to the Federal Drug Administration. My personal experience is that they work in my patients about 65% of the time, so they're not a panacea. The clinical practice guideline recommendation is strongly recommend against. They cannot recommend. Even though I've had some positive experience, the other doctors probably have as well. If you look at the studies that are out there, they're not very good. How about some of these newer injections? You may have read about them or saw them on the internet. Growth factors, uh, PRP, which is platelet-rich plasma. Uh, this has kind of been made famous by some of our athletes. Tiger Woods had this put in his knee. The insurance companies sometimes will pay for the injection, but they won't pay for the preparation of the substance, even though most of the time it's your own blood that's being spun down. But it costs to have the product spun down, and the cost of that if you look around the country, you'll see advertisements anywhere from $600 to $1,500 per injection. So it's pretty pricey. And there's no studies that really, at this point, prove it makes a long-term natural history difference in your arthritis. And if you look at the clinical practice guidelines, it's inconclusive. Over-the-counter agents like glucosamine and chondroitin, maybe many of you are taking them. Uh, there's numerous products on the market. They're not harmful to you. It's not going to hurt you to take them. But if you look at our clinical practice guidelines from the academy, it's a strong recommendation against its use because there's no study that proves that it works. I want to talk just a little bit about informed consent. It's a process, not just a piece of paper that you sign when you go to the hospital that says, I'm having a total knee or a total hip. It requires a frank discussion between you and your doctor, okay? And really, it's a medical legal issue in this country. If you look at knees, what are the things that can happen or go wrong? You can bleed and need a transfusion. And in this hospital setting across the street, the transfusion rate is probably less than 5%. It depends a lot on what your preoperative hemoglobin and hematocrit is. So if your blood count's high to begin with, your chances of needing a transfusion are very low. If you start out real anemic, then you may be one of those 5% that need blood. And obviously, the risk of a blood transfusion is HIV or AIDS and hepatitis. There's anesthesia risk, and Scott may mention that when he comes up, or Dr. Sotovia, things like stroke, heart attack, blood pressure issues. Infection, about 1% risk of that. It's higher in diabetic smokers, patients that have more um, medical diseases and rheumatoid arthritis, and sometimes it requires implant removal. It's a horrible problem. And maybe many of you out there know somebody that's had an implant removed because of infection. You can get blood clots. They can occur in your legs. They can travel to your lungs. A blood clot in your lungs can kill you. So you can die from a total joint replacement. We take a lot of precautions to prevent that now, but it happens. You can get scar tissue in your knee, and it causes a condition we call arthrofibrosis, basically a stiff knee. You can get uh, damage to a blood vessel or a nerve, a neurovascular injury. Loosening a wear over time can occur in a younger population. Most of these knees will last about 15 years, about 90%. For hips, many of the same complications. The differences are, with a hip, you can get a leg length discrepancy. Oftentimes, after a total hip replacement, your leg will be a little bit longer. You can get a dislocation. That may require surgery, may not. You can get a nerve vascular injury. And again, you can get loosening of wear over time. And as Dr. Sala just said, with these improved bearing surfaces in the hips, you can generally get 15 to 20 years out of a hip replacement that's well positioned. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you.
I got the easy part. Uh, those are the smart guys. They already gave their talks. So I just, I'm just kind of like the exercise guy that's going to tell you to get in better shape so that you'll do better. So my my job's much easier than than uh, than theirs was. But hey, it's good that all you guys were came up, come out. I was just kind of thinking about it. Uh, Dr. Ludwig and I started about the same time, about 30 years ago. Uh, Dr. Salas, he's he hasn't been doing it in a very long, only a couple of 20. And Dr. Satobi, uh, I don't know, he was probably in diapers when I started. So, um, Dr. Ludwig and I are clearly the seasoned veterans here. Um, so my job is to talk to you kind of tonight a little bit about uh, optimization and how, how you can be as successful as possible with your total joint. Um, it's clearly very important to your overall end result. Oh, how do I look like that, please? Got it. Okay. Um, so I, I've done this a few times, and this is kind of near and dear to me. And I think Dr. Ludwig and I have seen 30 years ago when we started, people with total joints would stay in the hospital two weeks. Now it's two days. So there's a lot more stuff going on. So we got to be ready. You got to be ready. Everything's got to be a little better. And Kind of the way I look at this is I don't know that we do anything that much better than we used to, but we do 100 things 1% better. And I think that's what you all have to think about when you go through this optimization or you begin to get ready for your surgery. There is no home run. There's not one thing you can do that's going to make everything turn out well. It takes a little bit of discipline, but you've got to address a lot of different issues and you've got to make them all just a little bit better. And when you do that to a bunch of things, it makes a difference and you actually will, will, will have a better chance of getting through this safely and uh, also have a little bit better result. So that's kind of my deal and that's kind of what I'm going to talk about. So uh, this is about change. Uh, this is about making yourself better for the surgery, to make your risk lower so that you can go play with your grandkids, you can go play golf, you can go and do bite a pack, you can do whatever you want to. But it involves a couple things. One, you've got to change your body. And every single one of us in here is not as in good a shape as we used to. And everybody may be able to use to run a, a four minute mile or whatever, I don't care. You have to live right here, right today, and in the present. Whatever you are right now, you can make your body better. So that's going to be part of it. You've got to also address your brain. Uh, people who come in with a good attitude, they do better. People who come in with a bad attitude, they don't do as well. So if you come in with a positive attitude, kind of a can't-do attitude, put me in the game, coach, I'm ready to play, you will end up with a better result. And a lot of you have your loved ones with you, your family with you, and that's important that you've got a good support system at home because this isn't real easy. And when you go through this total, total joint, <coughs> There'll be a few times you're not real happy. And there'll be a few times you need a little help. And there'll be a few times you get a little grumpy. Well, your, your spouse, your loved one, has to realize that and, and kind of uh, tolerate that. But you have to kind of encourage them. So this is not an easy process to go through. And you, you really shouldn't be able to, you just shouldn't try to minimize it. So we've kind of worked at this a while. And while we are not perfect, this whole process over at Memorial Medical Center, we're getting pretty good at it. Uh, Jennifer has been instrumental in starting the Joint Works program many years ago where we brought people in from a class. That was like a new idea. And we would talk to you about your joint replacement, educating, getting you to have some expectations. Um, you, when you think about your joint, you can kind of think about however you want to think about, but if you're preparing. You have to prepare for this too. This is, you don't show up the day of surgery and expect us to do everything. You guys are part of the deal, and we need you on board to end up with the very best result we can get you. It's interesting now, when you come in the hospital, you're going to be there two, three days, you're going to see 70 healthcare professionals. So this is a big deal. This is a hard deal. We've got to have 70, 80 people on board, on task. So this is really relatively high intensity. This is high power stuff here. So the better prepared you are for this, because you're going to get up and walk right away. We're not going to let you lay around. You're going to get up. You're going to get going. And the recommendations are, are two days for knees, three days for hips. 
uh, and, and our average is about 2.83, uh, I think. So we're, we're able to get most people out either the second or third day. So as you think about this, you become an active member of this, and don't think that this is just all on Dr. Ludwig to do a great job, and he's a great surgeon. He is a great surgeon. There's no doubt about it. Dr. Sala is a great surgeon. That doesn't mean all their patients do great, though. You have to participate in this. Sounded kind of preachy, aren't I? <laughs> uh, I, I think, well, I, I guess I get a little carried away. I, I, I think this is important. Um, this is kind of cool. Uh, if you take a whole bunch of folks, you take a thousand people with arthritis and you divide them into groups, and 500 of them get a total joint, 500, 500 of them don't get a total joint, guess who lives longer? People who got total joints. You know why? They do stuff. They're more active, they get up, they walk, their heart stays better, their osteoporosis stays better, their muscle stays better, their balance stays better, everything's better if you're active. So don't forget that, and that's one thing I will, I'm gonna preach on just for a minute here. Um, I didn't really know I was a preacher, but um, I'm gonna keep at it. Uh, this is a great slide, and this, and, and this really, you don't have to be able to read this, but I can tell you all about it, it's really simple. There's this list of a whole bunch of really bad stuff that none of us want, arthritis, back pain, cancer, strokes, name it, all stuff you don't want. And the only difference between these two groups of people is people who do stuff, physically active, and people who don't do stuff, physically inactive. Well, the people that are physically active have much less problem and much, much less of this disease so by being active. So I'd, I'd like to say, A, if you're thinking about getting a total joint, you have to keep this in the back of your mind. This, is a, this needs to be part of your decision that you may be healthier if you do a total joint than if you continue to get less active, less active, less active. So think about your activity. If your activity is horribly impaired, being stubborn and not doing a total joint may be a bad decision for you. This may be a good decision and you may live longer and you may live healthier. You may go enjoy your grandkids more. You may be able to get down on the floor and romp around with them and do stuff. You may plant your garden. We don't care what you do, just as long as you're doing what you want to do and then what you guys enjoy. So when I look at this and when we talk about it, there's, there's a whole lot of things that, that we would like to all make better. And uh, this is kind of a laundry list of some of the things. Uh, the weight is a big predictor of your outcome. So the heavier you are, it's easy to be heavy in America, I get it. The heavier you are, the worse your outcome is going to be. You're going to have more trouble than somebody who's very physically fit. If you're diabetic, and particularly if you're a poorly controlled diabetic, you have a markedly increased risk. If you don't eat well, if Cheetos is your, is your go-to food, you're not going to do as well as somebody who, uh, who eats fruits and nuts and vegetables all day. <coughs> Smoking, three times the infection rate. Heart disease, hypertension, and just being out of shape. So if you're not in shape and you don't walk around much, you are increasing your risks after surgery. Now the cool thing about this is that these are, these are modifiable, which means that... <laughs> She always, yeah. gets a, she always gets a laugh. Um, but, but these modifiable risk factors, that means that we can change them. This isn't some disease that has no cure. We can all lose weight. We can all get in better shape. We can all stop smoking. We can all eat better. We can make a difference. You can get better. You have to live in the here and now, though. You can't tell me about how fast you used to be able to run or you used to be able to do this, that, or the other. Dr. Ludwig used to be a great basketball player. He ain't anymore. <laughs> but we, that's, that's true of all of us. We all can't run as fast. We're all slower. We can't walk as fast. We can't stretch as much. We're not as strong. It happens. But we can all make ourselves a little better from our starting point right now. So my, my thing on this is this is kind of like spring training. I mean, Matt Pujols or Matt uh, Carpenter and uh, Matt Holliday, they can hit a baseball, they know how to catch a ball, but they go to spring training. Why? Because they want to get better. Because they, they know that everybody's going to be on the top of their game. You need to be on the top of your game. I can go run a marathon right now. 
it would really be ugly. I try really hard. I mean, I'd really try hard, but when I finish, I'd be I'd be in bad shape. Now in four months, I'm going to run a marathon, and you know what? It's going to be fine because I'm going to prepare for it. I'm going to get in better shape. I know what's coming. I have to prepare, and I'll try really hard that time as well. But my end result will be much better than it would be today. And that's what you guys got to look at when you think about doing your total time. You can get better. And if you do better and you prepare better, your course will be easier. Your hospital course will be easier. Your chance of complications will be less. And your knee or hip will probably function better. Because there's two things you want. You want to you want to have a you want to get through this safely. You don't have any complications. You don't have a blood clot or all that stuff. Dr. Wesley <laughs> talked about that deep bad. And you want that knee or hip to work well so that you're just body done doing everything you want to. Both of those are better if you prepare for it. If you don't prepare for them and just assume everything's going to turn out all well and kind of wish for it and tell me I'm, you're really tough, well, it doesn't matter. I'm really tough too, and I don't think I'm going to do very well running a marathon today. But in four months, I will. So you've got to take that same attitude that you can improve yourself. So... What do, what do we do about it? And we've got a couple things at Memorial, and I'm going to go quickly through them. If you're going to think about a joint, you need to think about clearly this First Steps program. This is something we've been doing for a couple of years, and basically our physical therapist and, and, and one, of us, one of us surgeons will sit down with everybody for about 30 minutes. It's out at the new Y. It's first Wednesday of every month. It's 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock. Dr. Sala, I think, did it last month. I'm um, still trying to beat up Dr. Ludwig to get him to go out there. Um, I don't think he might not know where it is. Um, but it's, it's at the new Y, and it, um, it will go over a lot of the things you need to do and begin to set your expectations. So your expectations are you need to, you need to get physically fit, and the physical therapist uh, out there will go through that. The Y is a wonderful place to work out. There's a lot of wonderful places to work out, but you've got to work out. And then I'll go through a lot of stuff. Dr. Sala will go through a lot of stuff. When you get your appointments, what you need to do beforehand, should you get on some iron, what should you eat, using some of the stuff we do to prevent infections, some of the, some of the soaps you'll use before. But kind of go through everything so that everybody's on the same page. So this is a good thing. Now, the, the really cool thing that's, that's happened lately is Memorial um, has seen kind of a need for this. And they, they've had a bariatric program for a long time. But they've recently kind of incorporated this weight loss and wellness center into it. And it encompasses all this, this services that Memorial has. Nutrition, counseling, uh, sports care, which is sports medicine deal, healthy lifestyle, bariatric surgery. So what you can do is you can come into this, get evaluated. If you're not in very good shape, they will look at you, they will look at your nutrition, they will look at your weight, they will look at your diabetic control, they will look at all this stuff, your smoking, whatever it happens to be, and they will begin to make a plan. So they take a, a, a big assessment of you, a standardized assessment, take a look at you, and then they will make a program that is designed for you, and it may be 10 weeks, it may be 20 weeks, there may be some goals involved, it may be hard. Who knows? It might take a little work to get in better shape. But ultimately, this group of people who need optimization, um, the people who have high BMIs, probably greater than 40, fairly heavy, people who have their diabetes not well controlled, people who smoke, people who are malnourished, uh, people who are very functionally poor, they probably will benefit from this. And if they do go through this, they probably will improve their results. So this is a customized program that you can get through with Memorial. All the doctors have this stuff in their office, and they would be happy to send it to you if they think you're appropriate for that. So I think that this is a good thing that we, the group of surgeons, we Memorial, think that you ought to be involved in if you need it. But it's another thing to me saying, you know what? I don't know if you guys read the Wall Street Journal article a couple uh, about a year ago. This goes along with what Dr. Ludwig said. You may be too sick to operate on. We may may not want you because you're going to have a problem. So we don't tell you that. We just tell you, hey, you know what? You're a high risk. Go through this optimization program. Come back when you're a little healthier, and we'll talk about it. We're not being mean. We just want you to have a good result. And, and, and you know, the, the bottom line on this whole thing, and those guys will tell you the same thing, you get one chance to do this right. If this turns out right, 
it's right. If it doesn't turn right, not right, you, it's 100% if it doesn't turn out right for you. So if you have a stiff knee, if you have a complication, if you have a blood clot, if you get a whatever, that's your life and that's not going to change. So your result is dependent on how you do at this one moment in time. So you really ought to be willing to put 5, 10, 15 weeks of work into this so that you really end up good for, by the way, this is going to be good for the rest of your life or not the rest of your life. So the Cardinals do well. The Cardinals won the World Series last year. They won the World Series the year before. They must have a good spring training. They prepare well. If you prepare well, I suspect that you will do well as well. So I think just a little bit about Memorial. I think we've got our stuff together here. We do a lot of good stuff. Um, we, are, uh, we like to consider ourselves a national leader. I think Jen's talked about the National Joint Registry. We're one of the 32 places that are, that are at the highest level of that in the country. We continually, and you know, my job over Memorial is to kind of keep an eye on things, and, and I look at a lot of things. We look at a lot of quality metrics. Both of these guys are on the uh, co-management team with me. We look at a lot of stuff, and we look at infection rates and readmission rates, blood transfusions, how happy you guys are. We look at a lot of things and try to continually improve those. So, we are always working to make that a little better, and we're pretty good so far, but I think we've got a little room to, a little room to improve. We'll take those questions at the end, and I think this is really simple, in my mind. Follow the crowd. There's a whole bunch of people going over there to get their joints over there. That's because we do a good job at it. So if you follow the crowd, you'll, be, you'll, you'll, you'll end up okay. So I guess the next is going to be Scott to Satovia. Okay, well, I've got a, a tough group of people to, to follow here. Um, I am the answer. I've been here for about eight years. And I've been involved with the, the Total Joint Program ever since I've gotten here. So I've had a fair amount of experience with the, the Joint Works Program. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about things that we've actually found that we can do to help you get through your surgery and recovery with less complications, better pain control, and just generally good things to, to make you happy with your experience here. It won't be quite as preachy as Dr. Adair just was. <laughs> but the bottom line is, is everything we do is basically it's a team-based approach. <clears throat> and you're part of the team too. So we can do things to help you, and you can do things to help us. Like Dr. Adair just talked about, optimizing your, your medical conditions, trying to be in the best shape that you can be when you show up to have surgery. So you're going to meet a lot of people when you come to the hospital, a lot of people before you show up in the operating room, a lot of people in the operating room, and a lot of people afterwards. And we all have your, your best interests you know, in, in our minds because we want to do a great job taking care of you. As far as the anesthesia goes, we want to do things that are the safest and the best for you. So what does that mean? We want to do things that maximize your recovery and therapy participation, just like Dr. Adair was talking about. You have to be able to participate. We want something that's reliable. Obviously, we want minimal side effects for you. And we want to do things that give high patient satisfaction scores, things that you're happy with. So along those lines, just generally speaking, we've got a few different choices. There's the old standard general anesthetic where you're asleep for the operation. Most of you that have had surgery before probably have had a general anesthetic. There's a regional anesthetic where we focus on just numbing up or, or having one part of your body not feel any pain. And then the third type is simply just injecting into the skin um, with some sedation or things like molding, <coughs> things like that. So obviously that's not going to work in this type of surgery. Uh, but what does work very well is the regional anesthetic. And the reason it works well is it reduces the blood clots that form in your legs. You don't want those. Those are DVTs. It reduces your blood loss during the surgery. And as we talked about a little bit earlier, you don't want to get a blood transfusion because there are risks to that. It reduces wound infections. You're less sick to your stomach afterwards. You do have better pain control after surgery. And you also have better pain control long term. So those are all pretty good things that we can do to help your joint replacement feel better. We can avoid the general anesthetic, so you don't need a breathing tube. That's always a good thing. You don't have to be on the ventilator. Again, 
less nausea with our type of anesthesia that we provide. Uh, the problem with the general anesthetic is it's working one minute and then we wake you up and it's not working, so you wake up in pain a lot of times, which again is why the regional anesthetic has a lot of, of uh, benefit over general. And then there's a lot of memory issues after surgery. You feel kind of fatigued, sedated the rest of the day. They just don't feel very well. So we can avoid the general anesthetic. And then the other question people are always worried about with the regional anesthetic and what that really is for this type of surgery is it's called the spinal. Maybe some of you have had that before, it's similar to an epidural, which some people have had for either childbirth or back pain. Uh, but it's a one-time shot in your back that numbs up the lower half of your body for a couple hours. So that takes care of all the pain you would ever have for this operation. Um, you could actually do it with just a spinal anesthetic, but most people don't want to remember things being in the operating room, hearing sounds, all that fun stuff that goes on. So we also give you medicine to help relax and not care about stuff. Um, for 95% of people, that means you don't remember a thing about being back there. Every once in a while, there's somebody that has medical conditions that prevent us from getting a lot of sedation. So you'll find somebody, about 5% of folks in the recovery room that say, you know, I remember hearing some things, people talking, some of the instruments, but I just didn't care about it because I felt so good. So we still give you lots of medicine, but again, depending on your, your medical history, your medical condition, sometimes we can't give you the, enough to be totally asleep. <clears throat> a few other things that were also mentioned before is we like to treat pain in a variety of ways. It's not just one thing that makes you feel better. It's a bunch of different things. So we give you medicines before you actually even go into the operating room. We've got some pills for you to take. And we use a bunch of different kinds of pills. We use anti-inflammatory medicines, and says is the other main form. We give you Tylenol. That works great when you combine it with this other stuff. We do the spinal anesthetic. We do also use some very powerful narcotic pain medicines, but when we give them in the spinal, we can give a lot lower doses, but they work much more effectively. And then we also do something called a femoral nerve block for knee replacements. And what that is, is there are basically two nerves that supply your knee. The majority is supplied by the femoral nerve, it's about 75% of it. So we can put some numbing medicine around that after that spinal block is in so you don't feel it. And that'll last anywhere from about 16 to 24 hours to help control your pain afterwards, too. Uh, hip surgery, we don't need to do that. We just do the spinal with some pain medicines in it. That works really well. And then the other thing we do is people always worry about getting sick afterwards. So we, we treat that ahead of time, even if you've never had troubles with anesthesia before. We give you both oral and IV medicines to keep you from getting sick. So that's usually not a problem either. As has been mentioned, your pain is meant to be manageable. It's not going to be zero. If you're expecting zero pain, you probably shouldn't sign up for surgery because you're going to have some discomfort. But we want it to be manageable, okay? With the process we've developed here over the past few years, if you follow what we recommend, your pain scores on the scale of zero to 10, with 10 being the worst pain you can imagine, is about one to three. Some, there are a few patients for whatever reason, can't have our protocol because of allergies, things like that. Their pain's a little higher, it's in the middle range, four to six. And then there are some patients, unfortunately, that do have to have a general anesthetic because of back surgery or other um, issues. And their pain is high. But, you know, we can, we can work with you still with those types of, of anesthetics when you have to be asleep to control it the best that we can. The final thing I want to mention about anesthesia is if you decide to have surgery, we do the, the protocol. You're going to show up on the orthopedic floor, which is 4B. You're going to have a monitor on your nose, and it's going to annoy you. It's designed to do that. What it's monitoring is your breathing. It's not just the little red light on the finger that everybody's used to. It's actually measuring when you breathe in and breathe out. All these medicines we give you to control your pain can affect your breathing. We want you to keep breathing. That's pretty important. So if the monitor is going off and means you're not breathing, it's supposed to wake you up. That's the whole idea. So I just want to mention that because that is a source of a fair amount of complaints afterwards. Um, is anybody having a shoulder replacement that's here? Is that thinking about that? We do have it's, the reason I put this on here is we, we do have a kind of a combination of anesthesia for 
shoulder problems, the combination of a general anesthetic where you're asleep, as well as a regional anesthetic where we know if your shoulder will last for a couple of days. So um, again, if you have any questions afterwards, we can talk about that. But it works pretty well for those, those surgeries too. The best part about all this stuff is it's changed over the years since I've been here. We started off doing one thing, we found something that worked better, so that's what we switched to. And that's what we're always doing. We're always evaluating how patients are doing, how they're doing with therapy, are they sick to their stomachs afterwards, all those things, and we can always change it if we need to. But we think we have a pretty good system in place to help you get through surgery as long as you do your part as well. So with that, that's all I have.